Hello everyone, welcome to our online workshop about the nervous system. My name is uh, Bruce, I'm one of the staff scientists that works at Science North and I'm joined today by my daughter, Pin it up. And uh, because of the lockdown, we're in our kitchen to present this uh, online workshop about the nervous system. Now, if you haven't done so already, you will need a few items uh, in order to participate. So you will need, what is this, Penny? A paper clip. You'll need a paper clip. You will also need a ruler. ruler. And you can take a wooden spoon or just a butter knife, okay? You'll need those three things in order to participate in our uh, workshop. All right. So, you know what? Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And we miss you. We miss all of our visitors. And we're hoping to see you guys soon at Science North and Dynamic Earth uh, a little bit later on uh, this year. And we're happy to provide this programming for free, but we would appreciate any donations that you might be willing to give us uh, to help us continue on with this excellent programming, uh, science programming in the future. So you can donate through your ever uh, bright link at any of the workshops you decide to uh, participate or click on the donate link at the, the Science North website, sciencenorth.ca. All right, very good. So we're gonna talk about the nervous system and uh, the nervous system includes things like brains and also the neurons and the nervous tissue that goes throughout your entire body. And the first thing I'm gonna show you, or I'm gonna show you, is a brain, a sheep brain. All right, so Renata, can we go zoom big? Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, ladies and gentlemen, I'm joined to get, uh, today by a, my colleague, Renata. So want to say hi, Renata? Hi, Sorry, everybody. I forgot, Renata. So if any of you have questions during the uh, workshop, just put them on the comments section at the bottom of whatever platform you're, you're uh, using, and then Renata will relay those questions to us. Okay, so... We're going to look at a brain together. Now, in order to do that, we're going to wear some safety glasses because the sheep brain that we are using is a preservative. And some of you are asking, well, why do we use a sheep brain? Well, people eat sheep. So there are companies out there that will collect the sheep brain and put in preservatives so that we can show people. And they're a bit easier to get than a human brain. People tend to want to hold on to their brains, but the sheep brain's a bit easier to, to get. All right. So I'm going to wear one glove. And what we're going to do is that Penny has a special camera here. There we go. And we're going to look at the sheep brain together. I'm just going to change uh, the camera we're going to use so that we can look at the sheep brain together. And it is a good model to that of a human brain. Oh, look at that beautiful sheep brain. Isn't this gorgeous right here? Look at that. All the features of the sheep brain. Now, what we're seeing is half of the brain. Okay, this is one part of the brain, the other part would be on the other side. So we slice this brain in the half so that you can see the different components of the brain. So we're going to try to bring the brain a little bit closer. There we go, Penny, if we could bring the camera. Excellent. Let's back it up. Perfect. So this thing that looks like a tail, that is your spinal column. Okay, that relays all the information from your body to your brain and the brain to the rest of your body. The top part of the spinal column, we call that the brain stem. We got the mandula oblongata in the pons, and that part of your brain will control kind of the an, an automatic system or the system that controls really your breathing and also your heart and heart rate. It's all done right here. You don't have to think about breathing. You can control your breath, but this is done automatically and also your heart rate. Then there's a portion right in front right there that's called the hypothalamus. That is the portion of your brain that controls, you know, your appetite, your desire to drink, and even your uh, body temperatures. It also links the nervous system to that of the endocrine system. Oh my goodness, what is he talking about? Well, the endocrine system is all your hormones. So this is the part that kind of bridges or connects the two of them. Then we have a central portion right there that's called the thalamus. And the thalamus takes all the information that's relayed from, uh, you know, your spinal column, takes all that information and then sends them to the different parts of the brain. It's kind of, kind of a relay station, a hub that will relay all the information to the rest of the brain. All right. And then we got this here that looks like a little brain. So that's the cerebellum. And that cerebellum is the part of the brain that helps to control your muscle movements, coordinate, that also helps with your balance. 
Uh, so if you're an athlete that likes to play, let's say soccer or swimming, or let's say you're a musician and you practice and practice and practice, it's this part of the brain that's involved with that. We've got another organ right here. It's right at the end. It's a little hard to see right there, right there. It's called the penile gland. And the penile gland produces a uh, hormone that's called melatonin. And what that melatonin does is it increases during the day. When it gets to a certain level, you feel sleepy. So it's the part of the brain that is involved with your waking and sleep cycle. Okay? It produces melatonin. Then there's a part of the brain right here. There's like a hole right here and it's surrounded that's the corpus callosum and the corpus callosum is a bundle of fibers that connects one part of your brain to the other part of the brain it causes it relays information so that the two halves of your brain the two parts of your brain will communicate with one another and then we got the top portion right here that's the cerebrum that is the part of the brain that uh you know animals use in order to move their you know limbs uh, in order to be able to analyze what they see or hear. And it's also the part of the brain that they use to think, all right? So it's quite neat, right? There's different portions of the brain right there. They each have, you know, their proper function. And we're still learning lots and lots about the brain. It's an organ that we don't know a whole bunch of. We're still learning much, much about it. Now, one thing about the brain is when you touch it, it's kind of squishy, okay? So brain material, the nervous tissue is very, very squishy. It's got the consistency of, let's say, jello, okay? So that's why our brains are surrounded by something very, very hard, which is our skull, all right? All right, so does anybody have any questions before we move on about the sheep brain? Any questions? Hey, Bruce. Yeah. So can you comment on the differences and similarities of the sheep brain and the human brain? Good question. I was actually going to talk about that right next. Very good question. All right. So I'm going to switch camera angles so you can see me. We're going to put the, the sheep brain aside for now. Very. That's a really good question. It's actually something I want to talk about right now. All right. So we saw the sheep brain. And I have a model of the human brain. There we go. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. So again, you got another portion of the brain, so I've only got half. So when you look at the human brain, it's very similar. We got the spinal column here. We got the medulla oblongata, the pons that's right there that controls your heart, your breathing. We got the hypothalamus right here, your appetite, drinking. We got the thalamus right here that relays all the information to the other parts of the brain. We got the penile gland or penile organ that controls your sleep and wake cycle. The cerebra, oh no, sorry, the cerebellum that is involved with your coordination and balance. The cerebrum right there, thinking in the corpus callosum. So if you look, it looks very similar to that of a sheet brain. But there are some differences. And what's the major difference, Penny, between a sheep brain and a human so brain? So the difference is that a sheep brain is smaller than a human brain. So one major difference is smaller, and especially this part right there, the cerebrum, okay? The cerebrum of a human is much bigger than uh, that of a sheep brain. And many biologists uh, believe that the larger the cerebrum that we see in an animal, the smarter it is which kind of makes sense because sheep aren't really that smart, right? And you'll see one sheep fall another sheep and they fall in a hole and they're not the smartest uh, animals out there. Whereas our cerebrum is much bigger. It allows us to think, to do math, to do arts and do all types of things that, you know, a sheep wouldn't do. Another thing also that you see a difference is if you look at the spinal column, it goes up and down because we're upright, we're sheep, there are on how many legs? Four legs are kind of horizontal, okay? There's other differences, obviously, between the sheep brain and the human brain. There's certain parts of the brain that are a bit more developed in a sheep brain, such as the sense of smell that, compared to the human brain. But generally, it's quite similar. So that's why we like to use the sheep brain as a model, because it gives you a good understanding of how a human brain is organized and how it works. All right, do we have any other questions about the brain? Uh, yeah, Bruce, can you point the hippocampus? The hippocampus. Oh, my goodness. You know what? I am not even going to try that <laughs> because <Okay. laughs> these models are not as accurate as they, they, they are. So, unfortunately, I'm not even going to try to point out the hippocampus. Yeah, that's fine. And some people are wondering what is uh, white matter and gray matter. 
Okay, so white matter and uh, gray matter. So white matter and gray matter are the different parts of, uh, of a neuron, your nervous tissue, okay? So the uh, white matter is the, it's the melanin uh, portion of the, uh, of the nervous tissue. That's the portion that is the fatty portion of the tissue that helps to conduct electrical currents from one uh, nervous tissue, from one nervous cell neuron to the other, okay? Whereas the gray matter is the actual cell itself, okay? So that's the difference uh, between uh, the two. So that's why when you look at this, you're gonna see certain sections will have more gray matter. Those are the actual cells, the, neuro the nervous cells and the neurons there. Whereas the white matter are the strings that come out of those nervous cells that actually transmit the information to other uh, neur neurons throughout the body. Okay, so that's a really, really good question. And why is the brain all wrinkly? And how much? Uh, does, oh, and how much does a human brain weigh? Good question. I'm not sure about the weight of the human brain. <laughs> that's a very good question. Why is it wrinkly? We're not quite sure why it's wrinkly. It's probably to increase a uh, surface area, to increase contact uh, between the different neurons. Now, what's really interesting is that one thing they notice, a lot of biologists notice, the more wrinkles there are in the brain, the smarter that animal is. We're not 100% sure why that's the case, but that's one thing they, they've noticed. And then you can actually follow certain wrinkles of you know, the human brain and other animal brain, and those wrinkles will correspond to certain uh, functions of the body. So we got wrinkles here, of the brain right here, the human brain that we use in order to move different muscles in our body and also to uh, sense different things throughout our body. So there's different sections in our brain that will have different types of functions. All right. That's cool, Bruce. So one last question, since yep. you're talking about the sections of the brain, yep. uh, where are the memories stored? Oh, good question. The memory is stored. We're not 100% sure, but some of it is like right in the interior portion of the brain. And it's stored also a lot with our uh, memories, uh, not memories, with our emotions. So a lot of the emotional components of our brains are right in the interior portion. And the memory is not too far from that. Again, it's not 100% sure how this works. Okay. So there's still a lot of research on this. But one thing that's really, really apparent is if you link an emotion to a memory, you will remember things a lot better. So that's what we do here at Science North. We try to make things fun and enjoyable so that you have a very good experience so that you can memorize and remember things a lot better. So if you can add an emotion to a memory, that will help you keep that memory a lot better. And I think a lot of us understand that, you know, you've, You've taken a class, a course, especially university courses. I've had that with professors like blah, 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 really boring. And you kind of fall asleep. I can't remember anything that that professor mentioned. But if I came across somebody that was very enthusiastic or some experience that was really, really fun, a good memory, a, a good experience, a good emotion, then I will remember that, uh, that experience a lot better. Okay, so memory and uh, emotions are closely linked to one another. All right, very good. Okay, so now that we look at the brain, I want to test our nervous system. And we're gonna do a bunch of tests together and you guys will be able to do it at home with uh, family members at home. So the first test that we're gonna do is called the two point discrimination test, okay? And to use that, we're gonna use a high tech device called a yeah, you're looking at me and say, what? That's what we're going to use. So take a paper pen, okay? And I want you to unfold it. So do that right now. I want you to unfold it. So we got the two points kind of sticking out. So I got one point here, and I'm going to take it, and I got the two points. So you want the two points to be more or less kind of equal, you know, in height or distance. All right, like that. So what we're going to do, your paper clip is going to look something like that. You take your ruler. And the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to separate the two tips roughly about, ah, roughly about a center. So they're separated by roughly a center. So I'm just going to do this. There we go. All right. So now we're going to use that to test how well people can detect these two points as being separate or may feel as if it's just one point. So Penny will take off her, her blue coat. We're gonna show you how to do this. Again, 
not difficult, it's not dangerous. It's kind of fun, actually. All right, so put your blue coat down. There you go, have a seat, Penny. All right, so I'm gonna just change the camera angle a little bit so you can see what we are doing, so you won't see all of us, but you'll see what it is. Okay, so essentially what you're gonna do, you can take an arm, you can do it at the back of the leg, doesn't matter, and you're gonna take the two points and you're gonna touch just gently on the surface of the skin without the person seeing. So Penny is gonna look away, she's gonna look that way, no looking. And I'm gonna touch her and she's gonna tell me, does she feel one point or two points? So we're gonna start right here. One point. So she feels one point. Two points. So she feels two points. One point. One point again. Oh, she feels two points. So now what we're gonna do, don't look. I'm gonna do it on her fingertips. She feels it as two points. So what I want you to do, I want you to do that. I want you to touch some of these arms just like we did, okay? Make sure the person's not seeing. And then afterwards, Penny's gonna do this to me, so I'll let you guys do it right now. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bring my two points even closer. Let's see. You know, I'm going to put it like only a couple millimeters in distance. And she's going to do the same thing to me. All right. I'm going to take off my blue coat. Here we go. So you guys can do this at home right now. It's called a two-point discrimination test. It's to test, you know, that certain parts of your body are more sensitive to that. All right. Go ahead, Penny. Okay. And feel anything. Oh, one point. Again, still one point. It's a cow. Oh, 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 I can't look. I feel two points there. Oh, yeah, I felt that two points. Oh, look at that. Cool. Very good. Very good. Excellent. So I felt two points and I felt one point. Now this type of test, you could do it on the back of your arm, do your hands, it's really important. You could do the back of your neck, back of your legs. You could do it any which way that you want. I'm just gonna put my blue coat back. All right, so try it out. And you will probably notice a couple of things. You will probably notice that there's certain parts of your body that appear to be a little bit more sensitive than other parts of your body, okay? And that's what the two uh, point discrimination test really tests. It looks at where on your body you have more neurons or more touch receptors than other parts of your body. And you will notice that, you know, on some parts of your body, you'll need to have the um, paper clip tips to be really far point to fill the two points, whereas other parts of your body, they can be really, really close and you can still feel it as two points. And you probably know this, that places like the back of your arm are probably a lot less sensitive compared to our, yeah. our hands and our fingers, right? So it's kind of neat that way. So I want to show you a very interesting model that kind of looks at that together. So I'm going to ask Renata just to change our screen so we could see this model. It's really, really cool. And it's called a homunculus, okay? So it's this thing. And you're looking at that and saying, oh, my goodness, what is that? So what this model demonstrates, it demonstrates the part of your bodies that have more sensitivity than other parts of your body. The parts of your body that are more sensitive, that have more of these uh, uh, touch receptors, so on and so forth, will appear much bigger than other parts of your body that will have less. So Penny, if we look at the feet compared to the hands, which part of the body is more sensitive? Is it the feet or the hands? The hands. The hands, right? Because the hands look, look much bigger. And if we look at this model, we notice that the tongue is very sensitive. The lips are very sensitive. So there are many parts of our body that are extremely sensitive, and which makes sense, all right? We use our hands quite a lot, and it's important to have that high sensitivity so that we know we're picking up stuff and manipulating stuff correctly. Whereas our feet, well, we use it to run, right? We don't need to be a sense of, imagine if our feet were super sensitive, every time we stepped on just a little pebble, it would hurt a lot. 
Now for other animals, their feet are very sensitive. So their homunculus would look a little bit different, okay? So that is based on that two point discrimination test. It gives you an idea which parts of the body have more of these sensitivity neurons, sensory neurons compared to other parts of your body. So it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun like that. So you know what? You can try this uh, at home, try it with other family members to see, you know, hey, which part of your body is more sensitive than the other. And there may be a difference between even ages. There may be a difference between you know, sensitivity uh, compared to somebody who's younger compared to somebody older. So try that. Try different age groups and see, you know, if is there a difference. All right, Renata, can we go back to our main screen? Excellent. So that was our first test. Before we, we move on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. take some questions, Bruce. Yeah. So how fast does the signal move uh, to the brain? Oh, that's a really, really, really quick, uh, good question. Now, compared to the, let's say you got, you stub your toe and it goes to uh, your brain. It's a matter of milliseconds. It goes very, very fast. It does not take long to go to, you, to your brain. And we're gonna talk about reflexes in a couple of uh, minutes. And that's even faster the way that the message goes. So milliseconds, milliseconds for it to, to get to your brain. Yeah. Cool, so does the, ner uh, does the brain have nerves on it? Like how does it actually feel pain? Ah, so the pain receptors, you got pain receptors on different parts of your body. They will detect the pain saying, oh, there's something going on but it's in your brain that your brain will detect a certain type of sensation as a pain, okay? So it all happens in your brain and where exactly, I, can't, I don't know, I don't know where exactly in the brain it will tell you, ooh, this is pain. Any other questions? Yeah, we have some other questions unrelated to, the, we can take those at the a end. Bit later on? Okay, yeah. okay, so because I wanna do our next test. And our next test, is called the reaction time test. This is a fun test. You will need a ruler. Okay, so what you will do, you will take your ruler, and you're gonna have to face the person, and Penny's in position, she's gonna have her fingers like that, kind of open, and I'm gonna put the ruler just above the fingers at the zero mark, okay? And without her knowing, I'm gonna drop the ruler, and she has to try to grab it as quickly as possible. Oh, that is kind of cool. So she grabbed it at roughly around 17 centimeters. We're going to do one more time, okay? So I'm not telling Penny, like, one, two, no, no, no. She's got to look. Oh, try to put your hands more out, your fingers out. Okay, your fingers out. Here we go. There we go. So she was at 19 centimeters. So I have a reaction timer ruler here that tells you how many milliseconds it took for you to grab uh, that ruler, but uh, they're really expensive. So what I've done is I've taken a picture. I'm gonna ask Renata just to put it on the screen, this picture, so that you can see you know, how fast you're grabbing that ruler. So Penny, she grabbed it at the 17 centimeter mark. So if you go to the top portion of that ruler, that picture ruler, I know it looks weird because that's on the side, but I had to do that so you can see it. Uh, so if you go at roughly the 17 centimeter mark, so her reaction time is between 0.18 and 0.19, all right? So try it with your family members. We're gonna do it again, Penny not. Now she's gonna do it for me, okay? She's gonna drop it for me. Try it with your family members and whatever mark you grab it at the centimeters, use this reaction time uh, ruler in order to give you an idea how fast that person reacted. Oh, I was terrible. I was at 23. What's my reaction time at 23? Oh my goodness, point, between 0 0.21 and 0.22. That wasn't good. Now let's try again, let's try again. There you go. Oh, a little bit better. Let's try that again, okay? When you drop it, make sure it doesn't touch the, the fingers as you're dropping, so just when the person grabs it. So try to be above as much as possible. Okay, oh, let's try one more time. Let's try one more time. Go. Oh, I can't say go. You have to do it yourself. Oh, there we go. All right, I'm about point, point two one, point two two of a reaction time. All right, so you can do this 
And um, you will notice that reaction times are really dependent on a person. So some people have a faster, better reaction time than others, and also on age. Reaction time tends to peak around late teenage years, early 20s. So somebody like me in the 40s will have a much slower reaction time than somebody that's younger. You can actually practice reaction time. You can use balls. Like I've seen NASCAR drivers that they take a ball, just a tennis ball, they throw it on a wall and they try to grab it with the other hand. So that's a test that you could do uh, to kind of work on our reaction time. And most people reaction time, the average reaction time is around 0.20 to 0.24. So if you're within that range, that's pretty good. That's, that's normal. Uh, athletes like sprinters, they have reaction times as low as 0.15. Okay, so their reaction times is a lot, lot faster than, than ours, than most people. And that's why they're athletes, because they can react a little bit better uh, than us, depending on the situation. Okay, so if you have young kids and you're doing this at home and you notice the kids, <laughs> they're not grabbing the ruler. That is normal. The reaction time gets a lot better with age. So when I tried this with Penny when she was three years old, she could not grab the ruler no matter what. But now at eight years old, she's doing a greater job at reacting to that. And that kind of explains when you're playing ball with them and you're not reacting as quickly as you expect them. That's it. The reaction time is a bit slower. They're just young and they need to uh, develop that. All right. So what's happening when we're talking about reaction time? I'm going to show you the next slide here. This is what's happening. So you drop the ruler, and what happens, the information from the eye, seeing the ruler drop, goes to your brain, right? Your brain then processes that information and then sends a signal to the muscles to grab it. So that is the reaction time. The amount of time it takes for the signal to go to the brain, the brain to process that signal, and then send the appropriate signals to the body so that you react to be able to catch that ruler, okay? So reaction time, like I said, differs between people, differs with age. Uh, generally, as you get older, reaction time uh, diminishes, uh, but you can do certain things to try to improve your reaction time. All right, do we have any questions about reaction time? No? No, we're good. People are we're just good. wondering how fast they were. Ah. But yeah, <laughs> but we have a scale. Yeah, okay, no. yeah, Leah, let's show that again. So maybe or you could look at that again out. and see how fast you were going. There we go. Yeah. So if you want, you can take a picture just with your phone, bloop, just like that. So that will help you uh, see what that reaction time scale that you're, you're at. I think you can actually look on Google and it's a natural reaction time scale you can follow also. It's just, there are a lot, it's just easier to use with a ruler than buying it. <laughs> that reaction time ruler, it's not worth it. <laughs> we have another one here for yep. you, Bruce. Yep. Why does your hand react to burning and not to electricity? Uh, why does it react to burning and not electricity? Uh, that's a good question. It does react to the two of them because electricity does burn your hand, so you will react to it. Um, you do have receptors on your hands and your body for heat. Okay, so just naturally you will react to, to that. Depending on the electri electrical current, you might not react to it because it may not be burning you. And also what happens with electrical current, it might counteract what's happening with your muscles and with the signals that, that's happening. So when, let's say you have a certain level of electricity and let's say you touch it with your hands or let's say you grab a, a wire with your hand, that electricity might actually cause the muscles of your hand to remain clenched. And it might give you that impression that oh, I'm not reacting to it. You are reacting to it, but unfortunately it's reacting in the wrong way. You want to release it, but the electricity is actually kind of doing the opposite for your muscles to cause it to, to contract, okay? Our muscles also uh, use an electrical current in order to contract and release so that if you give certain muscles, a certain level of electrical current, they might do the opposite of what you're trying to do with it. They might cause a spasm in that case. So yeah. that's the answer is that question. Yeah. So do younger kids have longer reaction times? Yeah. Because you commented that? Yeah, I think they have a longer reaction times. And I've seen that because it's funny, I did this workshop initially for the younger ones and then I realized very quickly it doesn't work because they have such long reaction. I think it has to do with the fact is those, those connections that happen in the brain need time 
need time to develop, okay? So they, they see the information goes to the brain, but then the brain is like, uh, what do I need to do now? They haven't quite built those connections. And by the time the brain <laughs> sends that signal, <laughs> the, the ruler's on the floor, it's, it's kind of sliding off a desk, it's, it's gone, right? You have, and that's, that's what kind of explain when you're playing ball with a child, they don't react as quickly. They develop that with time until the age of 18 to 20, then that you're at the peak at that time. Yeah, we have another one here. Why, uh, why do we have reflex? Oh, I think that's the next session. That's the next one. Good question. Let's look into that. So let's go back to the full screen and we're going to do a reflex reaction. So this is the one that you probably have done at the ho hospital with the doctor, the knee jerk reflex reaction. So I'm going to do it with Penny. And what we're going to do, like the ones that you get in the hospital, what happened to my hammer? Oh, there we go. They use these, these little hammers, right? And they boop right onto the knee and then the knee reacts and things like that. So we don't have that. So we're going to use a butter knife. Now don't use this edge, obviously. Use the, 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 the handle edge. And I'm going to show you how to do it uh, with Penny. Penny's got good, good reflexes when it comes to that. So I'm going to change the camera angle. I'm just going to, well, I guess Penny's going to get in position. So what's really important is Whoever is seated, you're going to do this with, make sure that the legs are hanging free, okay? So that you're not touching the ground because you want to see that reflex. So let me go. I'm going to change the camera. Penny's got the camera with her. All right. So here we go. So I got the camera. We're going to move here. Do we see the knee? So I'm just going to change my hands here. So we got Penny's knee right here. Okay, so this is the patella. This is the, the kneecap area. Okay, and you want to hit underneath as much as possible underneath. Okay, everybody's a little bit different. I tried this out with Penny, and I noticed that she's a little sensitive on the side of the patella. We're going to see what happens. Oh, there's a little bit of movement. I'm going to move this back. Okay, you don't have to hit too hard. If you hit it right, a little bit of movement. Yeah, still a little bit of movement. Ah. We, we got it the other day really, really well, even like an hour ago. So you want to go right underneath the kneecap. Oh, look at that. I hit that. And that's, that's not Penny. She did not do this intentionally. Here we go again. Okay, relax. Oh, look at that. That's kind of funny. She's laughing right now because it's funny. Oh! <laughs> That was a good reaction. One thing I noticed is if you have leggings, it tends to work a lot better. I've had people with really uh, tight jeans, it doesn't work as well. Okay? And everybody's a little bit different. Okay. When I do mine, it's not as good as hers. Oh. Oh. I don't want to hurt that person. Oh, look at that. No, that was. Okay, we'll do it like that. There we go. Excellent. Excellent. So Penny has a really good knee jerk reflex, which is amazing. All right. So you could do that with your family members at home. Just make sure, like I said, the um, the legs are just hanging off. Uh, for somebody who's maybe taller, if you do have a good sturdy table, have them sit on a table and just gently hit that. Again, you don't want to hurt them. You just want to have that reaction uh, happening. Okay. So somebody was asking me about reflexes. So I'm going to ask, uh, again, um, Renata to switch screens. I'm going to show you what happens right here. Okay. So it's called a reflex arc. So what's happening is that you have tendons right underneath your kneecap that when you hit the tendons, it actually causes it to stretch. And then you have nervous tissue neurons, that will detect that stretching and then send the signal all the way to your spinal column in the back, all right? At the spinal column, what happens, it will send a signal to other neurons, other nervous tissue that will cause your muscles to contract. Hence, that's where the leg moves, okay? And eventually you will get the signal to your brain to say, ooh, somebody touched me and my leg has moved. So to answer the question, when we're looking at a reflex reaction, Penny, here's my question. What is faster? 
Is a reflex faster or is a reaction time faster? Reflex. The reflex is much faster because the reaction time involves using the brain. The brain has to analyze stuff, send the signal to the parts of the body for that uh, signal to cause the uh, muscles to contract. With a reflex reaction, it's almost instantaneous. It uses the spinal column not the brain in order to send a signal so that your body will move a certain way. So the knee uh, jerk reflex reaction, you might think, well, okay, that's real fun and things like that. But how's that useful? Well, you use that when you're walking. Sometimes you're walking and you, you know, you, you, you feel something slippery or this uneven ground and you, you kind of seize yourself, you get back into position that was in your brain that, that really controlled that. It was this reflex reaction just so that you don't fall down. Uh, another good uh, example of that is if you put your hand on a hot stove, right? Your hand will get back, will just react real quickly back. And then you get the signal to your brain and say, ooh, that was hot, right? So it doesn't involve the brain, it involves the spinal column, and it tends to be much, much faster than a reaction time. So that's why sometimes you hear people use certain terms like you're talking about a hockey player, let's say like a goaltender, right? He makes an incredible stop and say, oh my God, he's got amazing reflexes. No, it's not the reflexes. He's got amazing, yeah. He's got an amazing reaction time. He reacted to that puck very, very quickly. It was not his reflex reaction that caused him to catch that puck. He's just got amazing uh, reaction time, okay? So make sure that we don't uh, confuse the two terms. So hopefully that answers the question about uh, reflexes. Do we have any other questions about reflexes? Yeah, so how does the brain uh, tell the other nerves in our body to do something? That's a very good question. <laughs> so that's a good question and we're still trying to figure it out, but essentially you get a electrical signal that is released by neurons in your brain that travel that extension of that neuron is called an axon and depending on the parts of your body you're trying to control it can go directly to that part of the body or goes to the spinal column and then controls other uh, neurons that will then control the, the different parts of your body it's it's quite complicated so sometimes it could be the actual neuron in your brain that controls a certain part of the body or that neuron will then tell another neuron to then control that part of the body. It, it all depends which parts of the body. So for example, the ones that you, you have for your face, your head, your eyes and things like that, these are neurons that will control directly there. But obviously if you're trying to move that little toe, there's a couple of neurons that are involved. So Bruce, does the elbow have a spot like the knee? That people could can try this? I don't know. It's a good question. I probably wouldn't chance it because you have an ulnar nerve, a nerve right here. And if you hit that, it hurts. So <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. No, I, no. I, to my knowledge, no, I, I, I haven't heard about that. No. So are, are there any other examples of reflexes in yeah. the human body? Oh, yeah. All, all, all of us have done that. You take a drink of water and it goes down the wrong pipe and you spit it out right away, that's a reflex right there. Oh, you, you don't want it to go into your lung. So that's a very good one. Uh, something going towards your eye, right? You get that, that reaction right away. So there's a few out there, uh, reflex reactions that, that help. And a lot of them have to do with maintaining your, your body position, especially if something were to shift or, or move, you get a lot of muscles that will react very quickly in that way. We have other questions about the brain unrelated to reaction or reflexes. Yeah, we'll take a couple more questions. Yeah, so is it true that the brain runs through memories for 10 minutes after the passing? I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a good, a good question. Do we, can we go back to the main screen so that people can see me a little yeah. bit? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, when it comes to memory, obviously repetition is is important so you repeat repeat you will remember things a lot more but as i mentioned uh also is if you have an emotional uh response that memory will be uh, inside your your brain a lot better uh, that way okay any other questions i'm skimming to we'll take one here. more one more question. Oh, yeah. So is the brain like a memory box from a computer? 
Good question. It's not a memory box. It does send electrical signals. It does send a lot of chemicals and the circulation of the electrical signals and chemicals will uh, maintain uh, certain memories. But unlike a box, let's say a computer box where the memory is there forever, uh, we find with a human brain, we tend to forget a lot of stuff, which is a good thing because you don't want to remember everything you did every day of the week and so on and so forth uh, because you just go crazy, right? You would just go crazy. So certain things you will remember that are really, really important and other things are not as important. Like, did you have coffee three days ago? Who knows? that your brain will, will kind of say, okay, this is not important. So it will filter what's important and what's not important. Now there are some people that have incredible memories and they will remember these things for a long, long time. And it does affect, it does affect their, their mental capacities and their emotions and things like that. So it's a, I think it's an evolutionary process for us to remember certain things that are really important. And then certain things that are not as important, put it aside because frankly, we don't need those memories. All I'll, right. just, I'll just hit you with the last one because they thought that was like cool. Are there any animals without a brain? Any animals without a brain? Well, it all depends what your definition of a brain is. So if a brain is, a, is my, many, many neurons together that work together to do something, yeah, there are some animals, some very microscopic animals that may not have brain. So here's a, a good example, Hydra is a little, little ammo. It's got these multiple arms and it's got a nervous system, but it really doesn't have a brain as such. But as you get to bigger animals, animals with limbs and things like that, they will have brains. Like for example, a, um, a, uh, an insect, for example, it does have nervous tissue. It does have nervous tissue where there's more of it right there. Is it really a brain? I guess it could be a brain, but it's not at the same level as, let's say, you and me. It doesn't think, it reacts to its environment. All right, is that it for yeah, the question? Yes, that's yeah? it. <laughs> All right, so we got a girl here falling asleep. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for joining us. And as you can see, it now these are very fun workshops that you can try at home. Okay, so try out the two point discrimination test with family members to see, you know, which parts of the body are the most sensitive. Try out the reaction timer. This is fun because depending on the person, even age, you'll see a difference. And then like Penny, who's got an amazing uh, knee jerk reflex, try it out with people, don't hurt people. Try out with people to see how a reflex uh, arc works within a human body. All right, so thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time.